So it's a really, really a great pleasure and a great honor to introduce uh, Professor Gert uh, Hittinger uh, here to, to, to you. I will do it short because it's, his biography could, be, could stay a lo long time and the summary effort he's doing. I will try to, to, to summarize it. Basically, uh, uh, he received his, his diploma engineer in 1969 uh, in Munich, and he obtained his doctoral degree from Tum in 94. But already in 69, he joined uh, DLR and uh, and became the head of the automation and, and robotics lab at uh, in, in 76. Uh, also, and very importantly, in, in 1991, he, he obtained uh, a, a joint professorship from University of, uh, of Tum. And since 1992, he is the director of the DLR Institute of R Robotics and Mechatronics. So, the accomplishments and the results are very well known in, in the community. They go from robot development in space, to terrestrial robots, to aerial robots, aircraft control, vehicles, medical uh, robotics, surgical robotics also, from artificial hearts to surgical uh, robots. Uh, he and his team have produced a number of very impressive uh, results. And I think something that is very important, he has built a very, a very powerful team, I should say, with very competent uh, persons there that are all motivated at doing excellent uh, work, very competent. And what I can tell you, because we are working and collaborating with them in, in European projects, whenever they do something, and they deliver something, it's done, well done, and it's really a milestone. Okay. And so, please, Professor. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for this very friendly introduction. Can we uh, get down the light a little bit? Yeah, I would like to talk uh, to you about our concepts and vision. I hope that there's at least a little bit science uh, in it. Uh, you can decide, and um, yeah, I hope that uh, everyone is interested in some part of what we are uh, doing. Um, the center which I'm heading uh, does uh, diverse things, uh, space robot, uh, technologies is a major part, but also uh, support for industrial robotics, main machine interfaces. In Berlin, we have a strong group developing satellites for fire detection cameras for airplanes and satellites. And in Oberpfaffenhofen near Munich, uh, in addition to space robotics and these kind of things, we are doing uh, vehicle design control, electromobility, airplane uh, control. Uh, simulation, modeling, uh, flying robots, uh, medical and artificial heart. I do not talk about all of them, but uh, about the major part. Um, this goes back a little bit. History is always interesting. Uh, yeah, we can make it uh, 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 less loud. Go a little bit down. Yeah. Um, that was uh, in the early uh, years of our robotic activities, at the end of 70s. Uh, direct interaction uh, with the robot, uh, be it remotely or in direct contact, was uh, from the beginning a big uh, story for us. And out of that, later on came the so-called space mouse, which is today still the most popular 3D man machine interface with approximately one million systems in, in operation. Uh, and we were working on force sensors very early. And um, for example, this uh, kind of interaction a uh, human hand controls approximately where to go and then by shared autonomy using hybrid force control as proposed by Mark Reibert and John Craig uh, then uh, refines the motion. Unfortunately, the video does not go very well here and, uh, and uh, makes a fine uh, path uh, planning and control. And also this kind of cooperative robot uh, with a very uh, weak uh, computer um, uh, that worked and uh, very low storage. I think we had uh, 120 kilobytes of storage. We had two force sensors and uh, remote control and cooperative control and, and all these kind of things. But uh, the, this we just do not really run here. 
Uh, and uh, a direct interaction, as I said, here we have a uh, six degree freedom force sensor. We have a force sensor in the robot. The robot tries to exert exactly the forces which we exert here and trying to learn and demonstrate. And that was just the time when Mike Brady detected or discovered our activities and pushed us forward and promoted us. M many thanks to you, Mike, as you are here. I was very happy to see you again. Uh, so we were very much involved by sensory feedback, dynamic interaction, direct interaction, and so on. And um, then in the 80s, um, Hogan came and others also came with ideas of impedance control, uh, which prescribed robot dynamics by virtual mass damping and spring. And uh, the equations you can see here, so if we have an external force, uh, we want to like uh, that the robot reacts in a certain way with uh, maybe artificial uh, mass uh, damping and uh, spring. And um, this position-based impedance control is also called admittance control, as you know. And if we set up the equations in Laplace transform, then we can arrive at delta x dot, uh, not only delta x. And then if we set uh, the mass and the uh, spring constant to zero, then we arrive at, at what uh, Dan Whitney had proposed already in the late 60s, the resolved motion control, the resolved rate control. So an external force should cause a velocity in Cartesian space. And uh, we used this kind of uh, technologies for quite a while. Uh, from today's point of view, you see here the um, control loops. We do not go into details. Um, uh, we, uh, the present state of our uh, estimation is that um, there's an inner loop with high stiffness, an outer loop, which is more compliant. We have good behavior for large and medium stiffness, good positioning accuracy, but we have uh, limitations for small stiffness, uh, large compliance, stability problems in contact, as a very general uh, statement. And then all of a sudden, we got the chance to send a robot into space that was inside uh, Shuttle Columbia. Uh, it was in 1993. Uh, one of the main experiences was that uh, the robot, which was built uh, by our specifications from uh, space industry, could not sustain itself on ground. So also, yeah, we made the motors fairly weak so that uh, weight was saved. Uh, in space, uh, you should uh, save weight, of course. But it could not sustain itself on ground. We had to sustain, sustain it by springs and uh, strings, um, so that was uh, not very convenient. And, uh, but the challenging um, moment of this uh, experiment was that we uh, tried to control the robot from ground despite of uh, six to seven seconds uh, signal delay. And there was also a lot of automatic performance on board. And uh, we developed uh, all these uh, concepts, which had already been proposed by Tom Sheridan and Tony Beji, shared control mode in teleoperation. Only gross commands are sent to the robot, and they're refined locally by sensor feedback. And on ground, uh, we had a simulation, predictive simulation, the same loops. But all this does not really work when there is contact. So pre-simulating contacts as a few seconds ahead is uh, not uh, possible, in our opinion. And, uh, even today. So um, the, these long delays came from the fact that you have at that time and still today, unfortunately, there is not the right infrastructure available. We had to go via the Atlantic, then to Goddard, then to Houston overland, and again up to the satellite geostationary White Sands, again up to a satellite geostationary, and then to the shuttle. And so we arrive at uh, seven seconds uh, round trip delay. And so it was very exciting. Uh, you see here the pictures, Shuttle Columbia, as you know, has dramatically crashed, unfortunately. This predictive computer graphic simulations, very small space for the robot. You had to dismount a bayonet closure. You see the opening, and the commands from ground were just turn the bayonet closure, and the robot locally felt, well, I would jam, so I have to do a screwing operation by, by myself locally. It was the only way to compensate for these delays, and worked, that worked perfectly. But of course, the, the most uh, well-known scenery was where we had a camera between the gripper jaws. We had no local loop at that, uh, in that experiment, just sent the pictures down to ground. The computers estimated the motion by vision of that time, sent up the commands, predicted six seconds ahead, and it finally uh, crossed. And, and you can see how exciting this was. The simulation, we, we could only rely on the simulation. And we saw that uh, the robot might do the right thing. So in the simulation, it really grasped. And then we had to wait six seconds whether the real images would do the same. 
and and, and they did the same. So it was uh, it was really exciting. It was uh, unbelievable. Um, because we could test the whole loop only when the shuttle was in orbit, not even on the, on the launch side. And so there was so much risk in that experiment. So, but that brought us to the idea we should have a robot which really can, can sustain itself on ground and can simulate zero gravity in the joints. And um, all these topics of torque control came up at that time. Um, and um, yeah, we tried to build a, a robot first, which should be very, very light, which had this grid structure. And we were so happy to have a gearing. Uh, we had developed a gearing with one to 600 on very small space. And then after two years, we found out you cannot cheat physics. A gearing with, uh, on small space with this high reduction does not work. The tolerances are by far not realizable. The friction is too high. We were disappointed. We had optical uh, uh, torque sensing. And, um, and then um, we, uh, the next step was really to go to strain gauge uh, sensing and also to uh, commercial uh, gearings which we refined, the harmonic drives. They were elastic, but the hope was that with our control technology, we might be able to damp the vibrations. And uh, yeah, then in uh, uh, 14 or 15 years ago, for the first time, we had a really compliant robot with uh, uh, torque control in all the joints. So um, we were um, happy, of course. At that time, most of the first hands had been built with strings, but we found out that uh, tendons uh, and these kind of strings are not reliable enough. Uh, we were disappointed. We had uh, roller, planted roller gearings and we dropped this design finally. But uh, it's, it's good to look back. And at that time, in the mid, mid of the 80, 80s, I have di discussed a lot with uh, Osama Makatib, who, in my opinion, has been the one who has most massively pushed forward the idea of joint torque control among all other researchers. And uh, we had the many discussions what is uh, the best way in the future for robots uh, to work satisfactorily with the environment, in contact with the environment. Now, for us, a big step has been the design of new motors, which after two years, pure simulation, all the physical um, effects uh, which uh, are important for such a motor, we try to optimize these motors for a typical robot behavior. Robot behavior is not circulating with high rotational speed, but high dynamics, permanently reversing, minimal weight, uh, minimal power losses. And then finally, we came out with this uh, third generation of lightweight robot. Uh, we had 13 kilo weight, uh, 13 kilo uh, load capability, only the power consumption of a light bulb that is 100 watt typically. And we were very satisfied, strain gauge uh, torque sensing. And uh, of course, we had now realized uh, the, uh, co the concepts which uh, were basically based on Katib's operational space. So, um, from a desired motion, maybe from an acceleration vector and some uh, desired uh, stiffness and damping uh, behavior, we calculate a virtual mass at the end effector, and the, uh, a virtual force torque sensor, and then we calculate the joint torques out of it and, uh, and we command it to the joints and we control it by torque sensing here. We do this in three kilohertz, and indeed uh, we saw that it's so easy to damp the vibrations with this harmonic drive, even, even harmonic drive did not believe at that time that it would be possible. But with control, it's, it's, it's possible. And um, now there are advantages for the approach. It performs well for small and medium stiffnesses, very good behavior in contact. There are some limitations for large stiffnesses and uh, limited positioning accuracy. By, but maybe positioning accuracy in the future is less and less important in my opinion, because we always want to refer to the environment uh, to use uh, sensory uh, information relative to the environment and not really uh, only uh, positional accuracy. Uh, yeah, we had this uh, experiments. Uh, Sami Hadadin is very well known meanwhile everywhere due to his safety investigations. We saw that these robots really were able uh, to uh, simulate uh, zero gravity. And KUKA is meanwhile uh, licensing uh, the arms and trying to bring them into the factories. Programmable damping, programmable stiffness, uh, with a few lines of code, you can do everything. Um, uh, next, uh, have your graph, why does it take, yeah. Um, and um, there are many um, technologies behind. We call it reflex reaction, real-time planning, 
Uh, you see here the medical robot, which I discuss a little bit later, the, the Pringles test, where we slightly touch it everywhere and then the directs everywhere. And um, the real time human aware motion planning uh, <coughs> with, with a little bit uh, lower the, uh, the sound. Uh, and uh, with Kinect uh, use and, and uh, tactile use and all these kind of things. And we made many investigations concerning uh, safety of robots. We, our goal is a handbook of injury in robotics. We found out that robots are not as dangerous as they are often said to be. And the head injury uh, indices uh, published in the literature so far had not been correct. So uh, many interesting observations. But for us, the most important um, um, behavior of these arms is uh, this compliance. You can take them by the hand, show them how to assemble something. Here we have also vision. Here, here on the left side, we have no vision, so it's pure tactile. Uh, you can touch them uh, everywhere. Robot without fences is uh, the big story at the moment in, in German industry. And um, so I think this kind of soft robotics was a big step forward. As I said here, there was no camera. So the robot just tried a little bit. And you know, of course, without vision, it's, it's tedious. But uh, the basic uh, behavior is good. Uh, then we made tests with uh, young boys and girls in kindergartens. Uh, so there are two um, teeth wheels with one uh, tooth uh, difference. And uh, you see that uh, the robot knows immediately uh, where the one tooth difference is. But the uh, young boy had a problem with that first, but now he's going to be faster than the robot. But that's a preliminary uh, result only. I think um, it's not very difficult now to become faster than any uh, adult and, uh, and any child here. OK. Um, then. Um, I mentioned already that there are a lot of experiments going on with optical sensors, with vision systems uh, based on time of flight cameras, or our own stereo vision system, which I explain in a few seconds or minutes, and uh, the Kinect system, or uh, then uh, um, reorienting uh, these uh, objects and uh, putting them in a box and so on. Uh, and uh, fortunately enough, uh, German automotive uh, companies are very much interested now in using these small robots without fences in their factories. And they say they can save so much space in, in fabricating. This is gear, gear production at Mercedes, and so on and so on. Um, surgery, for us, so important and so interesting because it is telepresence. The telepresence idea in space, I come back to that, says I want to work, manipulate on a location which is not directly accessible. So I need uh, stereo vision feedback and uh, force or tactile feedback. And this is what uh, the intuitive surgical company does as the first one in, on a commercial scale, transferring the human hand motion into the interior of the human body. You can scale, you can uh, reduce or uh, cancel the, the trembling and so on. And uh, the arms are still bulky, they are uh, expensive, but it was a breakthrough, especially in urology. As you may know, I think approximately 90% of the radical prostate operations in US are done now with these systems. In Europe, maybe 10 to 15%, but it's a real breakthrough. And no one, uh, I would say, no one has expected uh, that this would go this way. At the moment, 7,000 operations per week worldwide. Um, we had um, 10 years ago uh, approximately started to develop a surgical system with our technologies. Uh, first of all, we tried to kinematically optimize a surgical system. I think it's uh, kind of a, a science problem. Uh, we investigated with doctors uh, 20 types of operations in the human body, heart surgery, visceral surgery, urological surgery and put up the workspace which is needed, the reachability and manipulability and the precision, used the measures of Yoshikawa, which you can read in his books, and so on. And we finally came out with the surgical robot, seven degrees of freedom, with concrete uh, length of the first link using genetic, genetic algorithms. And uh, that was a, a result which surprised us. And from the beginning, of course, we decided to integrate uh, forced torque sensing into the instruments. 
So the instruments are uh, separate, small robots, uh, three degrees of freedom, two degrees of freedom for the, uh, for the end, and then for the gripper, uh, another degree. And um, then we built up this, uh, what we call the mirror search system, with all electronics integrated, very small arms, the nurse can move them along the, the operational beds. Um, they are highly dynamic, and uh, there are no big boxes outside, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's really a nice technology. Um, and uh, you can see the same compliant behavior is uh, uh, realized here, torque control in all joints. Uh, a nurse can easily uh, move them around. One can define any kind of trocar point uh, or compliance uh, point. It's, uh, everything is, is done by software. Here a little um, uh, more look into the electronics, which is integrated in the arms. We even have water cooling now in the arms in order to uh, not allow higher temperatures. And uh, as, as I said, we have uh, force feedback. And uh, our dream is heart surgery operating on the beating heart. So in reality, the heart is moving, uh, and uh, the instruments are moving uh, because they are automatically servoing uh, the heart due to the endoscope images, which are uh, transferred to the computer. And by compensating or, or stabilizing these images, either mechanically or purely by software, then the surgeon should uh, see only a, a scenario more or less in rest. It's not quite uh, ideal at the moment, but basically the surgeon should see everything is in rest, but in reality, heart and robots are moving synchronously. That's our dream for the future. And uh, you have to do a lot of uh, steps, of course, uh, for estimating the heart's motion. For example, you have these sparkling areas or these reflections. You have to reduce them, and then you get uh, stable uh, surveying of uh, some area. And uh, for predicting the heart's motion, we are also using the breathing frequency and the electrocardiogram, so to have a very stable and, and safe estimation. You can see here again, First, the robots are in rest, the arms, only the heart is moving. You see that uh, this part here is uh, bending, and now uh, it's no longer really bending because uh, the uh, instruments are moving synchronously. It's so easy to do with robots, therefore I'm sure that the future of surgery is really uh, robotics in many fields. There are other examples, but minimally invasive surgery is, in my opinion, one of the most challenging and important ones. Okay, um, I talked about the first hand. The second hand then, we went uh, away from tendons because they were not, in our opinion, reliable enough. Uh, we uh, went back to belt drives, to differential bevel gears, more classical technology, and we developed the hand two, which is still our standard uh, hand, which is uh, bigger than the human hand, uh, but on the other side, uh, we have approximately three kilo forces at the fingertips and the hand can withstand um, quite heavy impacts when catching balls. It's amazing what kind of energy such a ball uh, um, generates when, uh, when thrown. And um, so uh, it's, it's just a, a working uh, hand in different applications, studying grasps and so on. And um, on the other side, we try to commercialize um, simplified parts of it together with the Harbin Institute of Technology. First, a four-finger hand. Um, I think that approximately 10 hands are, are out there, and uh, also six or seven hands are out now of the new version with five fingers, uh, 15 actuators, all integrated in the hand. So the hands are modular. Uh, the robot can screw, it, screw them off and maybe screw on a special tool in space that might be uh, quite useful. And we have developed the first European Robonaut hand and are delivering now to the European Space Agency, ESA. Again, 25 Newton, or two and a half kilo uh, fingertip force was required. Um, and of course, uh, several redundancy and uh, uh, space uh, technology requirements, uh, which make the hand also bigger than a, a human hand. But it's quite uh, interesting now, also our Japanese colleagues from uh, Japanese Space Organization are very much interested in it. And um, yeah, concerning the hands, of course, we were always interested in um, prosthesis too. And meanwhile, uh, using the myoelectric signals uh, in the human arm, you must imagine that the hand should not be there. It should be an amputated person. 
but we can control up to five degrees of freedom independently now with this mere electric signals. But what went to the press in the last weeks uh, quite massively was this experiment with, together with doctors from the Brown University. Uh, this lady is uh, paralyzed since her neck, since 50, from her neck on since 50 years. She can move her head and she has her thoughts, of course. And uh, why it uh, became a paper in Nature, Nature is a high science a journal normally. We engineers are not allowed to publish in, in Nature. But this time uh, we were allowed uh, because after only five, 15 minutes of training, uh, that was for me the exciting thing. Uh, the sickness of her brain, uh, the connecting to the uh, neurons here, uh, were sufficient uh, to be mapped into control of the arm. And then she was uh, able to drink by herself. After this long time, uh, that was, uh, yeah, for us, um, uh, quite amazing. And uh, the training is fairly simple. We move the arm uh, to the right and tell her she should think that, the arm, that her own arm should move to the right. And then we uh, show her, we grasp uh, with the hand uh, the bottle and, and ask her also to think that uh, she should grasp uh, the bottle. And the same with the left, uh, to the left side, and so on. And um, yeah, I think this uh, this short training time was uh, the real uh, the real advantage here. Let me take out the, the uh, power supply. Has made a video. I don't know why the video do not really run here fluently. Uh, Yeah, and you see on her face that she's, uh, she really seems uh, to be happy and uh, she tries a little bit to move her, her hands, but it's not really possible. And she also can uh, bring the arm and the bottle back uh, to the table. And of course, for our co-workers, uh, this is also very motivating because Robotic people are often asked, well, uh, what is your work for, and, and do we need really robots in the future, and, and how important is all this? Could we um, spend the money for more important things? Uh, so it, it is then good to have this kind of technology. Okay, I, I move forward. Uh, we transfer this compliance technology to all kinds of systems we have, especially the hands, then the upper arm, and the, uh, we call it adjusting. And uh, for full body uh, compliance and impedance everywhere. And um, then we transferred it to the whole uh, body with a mobile underpart, uh, moving the whole system around. And uh, here you can see the mobility, a little bit, a little bit slower. Yeah. And uh, yeah, some of, of you have seen these uh, videos before, of course, but maybe there are a few young people here who are not so much aware. Uh, we have eyes uh, here. Uh, meanwhile, we have eyes at the ears also, so a broader, broader base. And we are unscrewing the vessel and uh, then move in the corns. It should look uh, a little, little bit human like. And of course, we have uh, voice communication and, and all this kind of thing. Okay. No, no, uh, should not come. Make, the, make the tone a little bit lower. 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 Not possible. Yeah? Does it work on my computer, you think? Yeah, you see here catching uh, the ball, uh, but catching simultaneously two balls is a little bit more difficult. So in this case, the robot should not move his head and estimate the motion just from, from uh, looking once. And um, so in all possible positions, he, he was also using the mobility. And uh, here we have, meanwhile, two justins. One is more agile, agile. 
and when he's throwing the ball, he uses his uh, mobility also. Because uh, with, uh, even with torque-controlled arms, it's difficult uh, to throw a ball. We were for quite a while uh, surprised uh, why this happens, but of course we know the solution. We have not uh, really an energy storage in these type of arms. We have no real springs, and um, therefore we have some limitations. Now, Christian Ott, studied at Nakamura's lab, we are very grateful, uh, very, very excellent cooperation, and uh, Ott, together with Technological uh, Technical University of Munich, has built up a, a group uh, in our lab, and you see the compliance all over the body again. Uh, I think this is important for, uh, for humanoid robots, and, and we saw some pictures from, and, and videos from Japan in the same direction, or here the, the balancing, the uh, very dynamic um, activities um, which, which you need in rough terrain, especially when you're later on moving there. Um, of course, we are very fresh here in, in terms of biped uh, walking, but with all these prerequisites, with these uh, compliant robot arms, you saw that the legs were just made out of the arms. We didn't make a new development. It used just the same system, and the upper body was finished in three weeks, again with the same technology, torque-controlled arms, and you can finish a humanoid robot really in, in, in very short time. I shouldn't go too much into details. We are using a slip dynamics concept, spring-loaded inverted pendulum as a limit cycle generator. A slip model produces human-like contact force profiles for walking and running. We apply the limit cycle dynamics to multi-body systems and use inverse dynamics, passivity control, and energy control for compensating energy loss at impact. Uh, a few other uh, pictures here. As I said, uh, we are uh, concerning walking. We are a little bit newcomers, but uh, with these uh, arm technology, you can move quite uh, quickly forward. And what, what was nice, we had the Automatica, which is a big robot fair, uh, 14 days ago, and uh, we had a, a party and there came a, a music band and played some music and uh, we just pu uh, put the robot in front of them and without any training and, and, and a test before, uh, it was amazing that it immediately... It immediately worked with Bavarian music. It was just for fun, but as I said, there was no test, there was no training before. It was just spontaneous. So we were uh, uh, quite pleased. Uh. Okay, uh, yeah, we are now uh, continuing in two directions. One is uh, the torque controlled arms, providing them with additional force torque sensors in the base and in the wrist to have some redundancy and to uh, apply a mixture of admittance control and joint, joint torque based impedance control and many other features like touch screens here so you can program the robot uh, very easily and, and touch it and, and these kind of things. And the other direction is um, what, we, what uh, people are calling the variable impedance actuation. We're using nonlinear adaptable springs but control structures as before. Uh, Piki is very strong in that area, uh, by the way, as, as many of you know, we have beautiful European projects. Uh, it's partly based on the imagination of the human arm, human muscular system, the antagonistic joint drive principle with biceps and triceps, and where we uh, typically have two motors, uh, either to move the joint or to adapt the stiffness. And um, out of that came an arm and a hand where we say uh, we have never before so close uh, to human uh, performance concerning uh, the uh, nearly same weight as the human arm system, the same dynamics, uh, the same grasping forces. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see that we have 19 degrees of freedom in the fingers. The tendons have become much more reliable now, so we went back to tendons. We have 55 uh, tiny motors, so the system is complex, but in its performance, it is able in, in particular to store energy and to be, to be inherently soft. That's, uh, that's the story. Hammering was not uh, before uh, possible for us. 
And, um, and here we were amazed that uh, this uh, YouTube video had in very short time, I think in one day, 100,000 accesses, especially from uh, people of uh, the US Army, um, because the interest is, uh, well, if a robot with tans uh, just being hammered, uh, that might be the ideal soldier of, of the future. That's my interpretation. So it's like when humans hit uh, the table, uh, it's not only that the sensors say, oh, it's, it's aching, please uh, withdraw the fingers, but it's inherently mechanically uh, compliant. And uh, in this hand-arm system with its uh, 55 tiny motors, we have three types of uh, variable impedance realizations. One is uh, with uh, two uh, motors which are working this way, either moving the joint or changing the stiffness. And then uh, when there is an external load, then first the springs react, and then uh, after that the motors uh, react. But the very fast reaction is via the springs. Uh, the the second alternative which we use in the underarm rotation and the wrist is uh, two equally sized motors again, but both uh, motors push and pull, so more or less we have uh, double uh, the, the torque here. Uh, and, um, oh, excuse me, uh, I, was, I was too too quick. Changing stiffness in this way, some differences, and again, external load uh, in this way. And the third, um, uh, Vision, uh, version is then the uh, adjustable stiffness actuator where we have just one motor for moving and uh, one a smaller motor for changing uh, the stiffness. And if we uh, drop this motor, leave it out, then we have the serial elastic joint, which is used in uh, several of the more uh, recent uh, robot designs. It's also used uh, more or less in the, uh, in the um, in NASA's uh, Robonaut. Uh, you can see here again the behavior of these arms. They are absolutely compliant. And uh, yeah, there is um, a lot of joy apparently with this kind of, of, um, of work. Uh, the designer, one of the designers of our group, hammering with a, a baseball. Very compliant. Yeah, uh, as I said, the uh, Robonaut of uh, uh, NAS, uh, which is on the space station since uh, it's nearly one year, uh, is more or less based on this um, um, serial elastic uh, actuators. I showed it already. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, now you can see with a classical um, uh, torque controlled robot, uh, we have some, we have. E Beautiful compliance. Uh, and we can do nice things like uh, basketball, uh, dribbling without vision in this case. It's important. Uh, our record is at the moment 140 times, absolutely blind. Just uh, there are kind of fingers, it's just elastic uh, metal. And uh, the sensing is really in the, in the uh, joints. And, uh, but on the other side, of course, there's energy storage uh, in, in this uh, variable impedance um, actuators or variable stiffness actuators. Uh, this allows to throw balls uh, quite uh, a distance, as you can see, high dynamic. And that was also one of our nice experience, this arm throwing a ball and just in catching the ball, visually controlled. Ah, yeah, here, here you can see it maybe better. It was also a very spontaneous experiment uh, during our uh, uh, nice uh, robot research conference in November. Yeah, back to space robotics briefly. Um, the second experiment we made uh, in space was with the Japanese colleagues in 99, uh, the first free-flying robot, a robot waving around on a satellite. And uh, we did, again, uh, teleprogramming, sensor-based offline programming from ground. But, and, and you can see here a few pictures, this, the robot was 800 kilometers high. This is the Earth here, the white rim. We used vision uh, feedback and uh, force, uh, also contour following here. But maybe the most exciting experiment was switching off the attitude control system and waving with the robot around uh, like a cat waving with her tail. We are talking about swimming operations. And by this, you can dedicatedly reorient the whole satellite in a very dedicated way. The advantage is that you are moving a mass, and then the, the satellite and the whole system is in rest again. With present-day control actuators, 
They are rotating maybe with uh, 8,000 revolutions uh, per minute. Uh, and, and you reorient them um, uh, like gyros, uh, you have vibrations. And for these new, highly uh, high resolution optical satellites, this is disturbing. You want to have this whole system in rest. And so we see uh, quite a future for this type. It need not necessarily be a whole uh, six or seven degree of freedom arm. We can use um, high torque wheels with, with uh, yeah, high uh, inertia. And uh, we think that might be a big uh, story for future um, optical space satellites. And you can see that even with um, panels, which are, of course, then uh, vibrating, uh, we can damp them in a very short time by control theory. We have used this technology, um, uh, damping vibrations, just by uh, intelligently controlling the motor currents via the inverse dynamic model. We have done that in the late 90s, and this brought KUKA a lot of uh, advantage, and I think was one of the main effects bringing them up to number three in the world. So with this, just calculating the dynamic model, this is uh, uh, the, um, that was the old system, and now with um, implementing dynamic model in real time and controlling the motor currents without changing uh, electronics and mechanics, the robots were much more quiet and, and much quicker and in the automotive companies. Here you again see the difference. And we are using uh, some uh, multi-physics uh, simulation and modeling languages, uh, modeling airplanes, uh, cars, and also high-speed trains, all the, the same technology very uh, powerful. Now, uh, but our third experiment in space um, was finished one year ago. For nearly seven years, we had a small arm with this torque control joints on the space station. We moved along the contour here, and um, the reason of this experiment was twofold, to space qualify this motor technology of the lightweight arms, and uh, because there were seven years in, in free space, and the other one was to demonstrate telepresence. So when moving along this contour, we sent uh, down to Earth stereo images, two eyes were here, and we sent down the forces. And in this case, it was possible because we did this experiment then when the space station flew over us, so only seven or eight minutes visible, but uh, a distance of 300 kilometers is nothing. So the delays is on only 20 milliseconds. And you uh, had a feeling in the, in the force reflecting joystick on ground, uh, not uh, discriminable from the situation when the, when the system mock-up was standing three meters uh, far from you. It's uh, absolute fantastic uh, high fidelity force feedback. You can see here uh, drawing uh, springs and, and the robot had to do several tasks, contour following and so on. So, um, the, and we brought the system back, the Russian cosmonauts brought it back to Earth and we tested it in our cellar and it uh, moved uh, immediately as if it had never been, sp been in space, so there were no damages at all. And the last, um, um, in the last phase of this experiment, we controlled it from home, uh, from the private house of our project leader. So this is what uh, NASA people told me, that they were dreaming quite a number of years of to control something in space uh, just from home, not via the big control stations and and, and so on. That was uh, quite motivating. The next step here will be uh, the vice versa system, uh, bring uh, uh, the stick to the space station and control on ground um, the same arm. And uh, this is to prepare uh, the situation where later on uh, astronauts may circulate around Mars and may then from the orbit uh, control a robot which has already descent on, on Mars before they are going down. Maybe they go then down uh, with the next flight or something like that. This is quite interesting with the delays uh, in Earth orbit. Um, in order to have a longer um, coverage than the seven or eight minutes in direct overflight, uh, three, uh, three quarters of an hour approximately are coverable by just one uh, geostationary satellite. You have to go up once, uh, go down to the low system, uh, up again and down uh, to the operator, and then we arrive at approximately 600 milliseconds. If we control in geostationary orbit, we have only to go up uh, and uh, go down, and then only uh, 300 milliseconds. Uh, this is doable when, when we have the right infrastructure available in space, which is not yet uh, the case. 
But fortunately enough, we found out theoretically that we can compensate uh, up to six, 700 milliseconds really very powerfully with uh, time domain passivity control technologies. We do not know this uh, from uh, since a very long time, but uh, now we, we have the technologies and we are making at the moment experiments in, uh, with Korea, controlling uh, with our uh, hand controllers here, which are again lightweight robots, controlling uh, systems in Korea. And via the internet, you have delays only of 300, 400 milliseconds, so even, even smaller. So we can say we can control everywhere uh, in Earth, on Earth or in Earth orbit, robots with force control, force feedback. And um, the next step in, in um, space, um, in orbital space technology is by sure the removal of uh, space debris. We had a crash of a big uh, German satellite which brought down one and a half thousand kilo uh, to Earth. Fortunately, it uh, crashed into the uh, Indian Ocean. A few minutes later, it would have uh, flown over Beijing and uh, not uh, to imagine what uh, would have happened if it would have hit the, the city. Uh, since a few weeks, uh, maybe the biggest satellite which the Europeans have built so far does no longer work. And people are afraid if it is hit now by a uh, part of a, a broken satellite, it might explode and there might be so many particles in space that uh, human spaceflight would no longer be possible. Our next demonstration will be uh, indeed the catching of a non-cooperative tumbling satellite, releasing it, playing cat and mouse, but the Chinese will do the same and the Chinese will be faster. We have uh, been working and proposing these kind of technologies since uh, 12 uh, to 15 years, at least 10 years actively working there. Uh, but um, we see that uh, our colleagues from China are faster, they probably will do something similar, uh, maybe already next year. Um, simulating this in the laboratory is not so complicated. Here, two lightweight arms, one is carrying a satellite, the other one is trying to grasp it. Apparently has a, a, a base floating in space, so we have reaction forces and reaction motion, and we have to uh, superimpose this reactive motion to the target. This is the typical technologies. We have done this often with this uh, demonstration. We are catching a, a geostationary satellite which has nothing to grasp, can uh, probably uh, most successfully done with such a capture tool which enters into the uh, apogee nozzle which each of this, this satellite has. Using vision can be done fully autonomous and then spreading up a finger and then uh, being connected. That would uh, be used for prolonging the lifetime of satellites which run out of code gas so approaching them uh, automatically, uh, fixing themselves. Uh, this rescue satellite has solar panels and by an ionic thruster, so it would not need only code gas, by just an ionic thruster, uh, it could cause the torques which are needed to provide attitude control um, for another number of years here. Concerning asteroids, we are going now a, bit, a little bit into outer space. Uh, we are uh, cooperating with the Japanese uh, JAXA um, space organization. Uh, we are cooperating on a mission, a Hayabusa mission, uh, to an asteroid. And of course, we want to hop over the asteroid. And uh, this is quite critical because it's only maybe 1% of gravity. So if you hop too, too far, then you are you're leaving uh, the asteroid. And we designed a very simple technology, just kind of an excenter, and, uh, and which, which really hops them. And we are do parabolic flights to, with airplanes to uh, verify that. But a moon or Mars, uh, what is uh, the optimal solution? Um, NASA is working on kind of centaur system from a Greek uh, um, history. And uh, of course, we have drawn pictures with our uh, Justin. We do not know what is optimal. We would be happy to jump over moon and to have a humanoid. And uh, we have discussions uh, with Japanese colleagues, uh, Inoue and, and Inaba and also Nakamura. Maybe we can do a joint mission. We would be happy to send a humanoid uh, to, uh, to Moon. That has a little bit another context I explain in, in a second also. Um, on these um, planetary exploration scenarios, um, we developed uh, different uh, mobility um, concepts like crawling with uh, six legs. What you can see here is real-time 
uh, this parity image generation from these cameras that is a distance map in real time that the robot finds out uh, where are the yeah, obstacles to be avoided. He looks now around, he sees the other side, and then he can generate a path in, in real time. But by the way, the crawler is also very soft everywhere. And um, of course, we are, and again, a little bit in terms of science, we are, uh, use bionic pa gate patterns. They allow, to, um, uh, they allow for the failure of single legs. So what happens if uh, the robot has only uh, one leg less, or maybe two legs less, as you can see here, one leg, and so on. Uh, this is uh, quite interesting uh, work going on in that area. And um, I'm a little bit unhappy that we have been working now for three years on a European Mars rover, ExoMars. And it seems that the program will be stopped. There will be a final decision in November and the minister conference. Uh, but uh, the costs seem to be too high. NASA has withdrawn now because NASA is also running out of money. Uh, the Europeans are negotiating with the Russians. Uh, we have developed the drive systems for the breadboard and we are testing the rover in our lab. Uh, but uh, I'm very unsure whether the whole project will be uh, really uh, running. Um, in contrary, we are also developing rovers for Moon. We are uh, of simulating all the Terra mechanics, of course, for Mars and, and Moon rover. But interestingly enough, maybe you have heard there is a Google Lunar X Prize. Google has um, announced $30 million for uh, the one who flies as the first to Moon privately drives there 500 meters and sends high-definition uh, high pictures to the Earth. And we have um, a close cooperation with the German-Austrian team. There are now five teams which seem to be the finalists. Uh, the flight should be already in 2014 or 2015. And the part-time scientists with whom we uh, cooperate, it's, a, it's an assembly of young people, engineers from universities, and with our help, we have uh, developed a rover. The rover is not the problem. We would like to fly four rovers uh, simultaneously, and I propose to uh, Hirochika Inoue that we replace one of these four rovers by a humanoid. That would be even, even more interesting. But uh, our goal is to, to drive quickly. Uh, I think we can drive approximately three times as fast as uh, this first version here. And we have this real-time stereo using the, our technology, the semi-global matching which you saw in the crawler also. It generates a 3D model of the environment in real time. And um, we would like to land near Apollo 17 and then drive to, one, to, to the vehicle which the astronauts have driven at that time and to make uh, high definition uh, pictures, send it to the Earth. I, I suppose everyone would look there. So if you have some extra money, please tell me. Uh, it would be uh, great, of course, if we would have a, a strong European team. Uh, a very strong uh, team from US is Astrobotics from Carnegie Mellon, by the way, uh, you know, and uh, it's just a, a nice competition. Out of these technologies, we have developed a, a robotic electromobile uh, based on a fully uh, autonomous uh, camera uh, technology and, and image processing. You see stereo cameras everywhere. No other systems, no, no radar in this case. And um, I state that uh, robot and cars in the future become the same. We have an idea of how the system should move, be it a robot end effect or a car. And then we have the actuators. Uh, where we bring uh, the uh, torques uh, via a uh, inverse dynamic and kinematic model. In the car, of course, the situation is more complex even because we have to include the tire model, not only the actuators, the wheel hub motors. But the mobility is uh, quite nice for this type of uh, vehicles. Uh, we talk about wheel robots. Uh, every wheel is independent, is actuated, is steered, is braked and uh, can uh, drive vertically to its orientation or rotate around the axis, uh, rotate around any axis which you can define and drive with a side stick. So you, you just indicate the rough uh, direction where it should go. Okay, uh, and the nice thing is that uh, Daimler, as one of the leading car manufacturers in Germany, uh, has detected the stereo algorithm and is implementing them in the next generation of S-Class cars, so the high, the premium cars. If you have enough money, then please buy one and see how it works. Uh, uh, this stereo algorithm is a replacement of classical correlation technologies, 
by global energy functions and pixel-wise mutual information-based matching, uh, formerly uh, this correlation-based window technology, we always had uh, the problem that uh, sharp edges were breaking off. And then the first results already showed that we got much better with this algorithm. And it's quite nice that the International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing indicates that robotic really has uh, given some impact uh, on, on photogrammetry. And um, yeah, originally we started this work with the uh, pictures from Mars. Uh, DLR has a camera flying around Mars since seven years, um, providing beautiful line uh, data. It's a stereo camera with nine lines. And uh, I think that 70% uh, of Mars is meanwhile modeled in a resolution of 10 meters, 10 to 20 meters. And by hand of this data, we first had developed this uh, stereo algorithm. The valleys are approximately seven kilometers high here. And uh, the biggest canyon of the solar system as far as, there must have been water and glaciers as far as the planetologists say. And there is uh, real water ice to be seen on Mars also. So quite exciting experiments. Meanwhile, we have modeled mountains like the Mount Everest from an orbit around Earth also. And these optical satellites now uh, are typically at in the range of uh, 30, 40 centimeters. And um, yeah, and, but these are uh, models from airplane uh, down to 20 centimeters. Meanwhile, we go down to five centimeters with, with airplane uh, cameras, airplane-based cameras. So the technologies are very general, uh, and it's also um, towards the end of my, my talk, we are using this landscape models then for de developing new flight simulators uh, based on uh, big uh, robot systems on rails. It's unbelievable how you can cheat the human uh, physiological uh, system and uh, what you can uh, simulate and, and uh, yeah, really how you can um, cheat uh, the, the, the human uh, sensitive system. Um, and uh, there's in Germany also Max Planck Institute that's, uh, which is doing a remarkable work there. And um, finally, uh, concerning this 3D modeling, um, we are of course um, using flying systems, either real airplanes or small uh, UAVs. They are very popular. Uh, some uh, doctoral students of my institute um, have um, started a company. The ascending technologies, uh, the octocopters and quadrocopters are used everywhere. They have also close cooperation with uh, Daniela Rus from MIT. And um, we have flown uh, around our church, um, have shot approximately 60 photos, and, and then generated a five centimeter model out of that church. The technologies are becoming better and better and faster and faster. I'm just uh, nearly finished, okay. Um, but to say um, generally that um, the uh, generation of 3D models is uh, one uh, major goal. On the other side, we are also aiming at manipulation from the air. That's also a big story uh, going on with Vijay Kumar in, in US. And others, you saw that the small helicopter has a small hand. It's even a prosthetic hand and has grasped something from the earth. I think for security and these purposes, uh, this is important for the future. A very uh, highly mobile airship, uh, just as an, an add-on, more or less a private action from my side. And quite interesting, a solar-powered platform, which will also be a kind of a robot, a UAV, flying in 22-kilometer height, uh, making pictures, generating 3D models, and so on. So uh, robotic technologies everywhere. Um, and these UAV technologies is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most challenging uh, fields, uh, upcoming fields, uh, which uh, touches nearly everyone in, in, even in daily life. That was the first flight uh, we made a couple of uh, uh, months ago. And um, to finalize this 3D modeling, um, uh, concept. We are going into churches and famous buildings like the castle of King Ludwig, the mad one, um, with laser scanner, but more and more only cameras, laser scanners only for rough modeling, and then the fine modeling with our stereo algorithm in one millimeter resolution, like these Baroque churches, which are very difficult to model, and a number of uh, the most famous rooms in King Ludwig's uh, castles, like the 
the throne saloon or the, uh, the mirror saloon in, in Herren Kinsey. Difficult to model with all these uh, illumination systems and so on. You can imagine that. Thank you very much for your attention.